Good morning, everyone. So it sounds like we've got a continual path this morning. Um, so I'm here this morning to talk about hardware security. And really, what is it that makes IoT devices difficult and different from our security basics? And more so, how we can use hardware integrity to help bridge that gap. So we're going to talk about ARM Trust Zone, uh, the hardware root of trust for ARM-based processors, and TEE, Trusted Execution Environments. So in the OT world, we've been doing availability as king for years. In the IT world, they do confidentiality as king because you don't want to lose your customer's data. I think with the increased amount of automation and the increased amount of communications that we're putting in IoT devices, and as we're transferring local control up to the cloud, integrity will be king. Now, when we usually talk about integrity, we're talking about data integrity. In this particular application, we're going to talk about software integrity and integrity of actions in your devices. What we've seen in the last few years is when attackers are going after IoT devices, they're not doing destructive attacks anymore. We're not erasing software or bricking a device. We're not crypto locking the device. What they're trying to do is get a long-term presence on your device and turn it into a revenue stream for themselves. Last year, an F5 report on IoT, uh, I think it was our IoT State of the Union report, said that their trends are seeing more people installing bots to do DDoS attacks. We're seeing more crypto miners being installed on a permanent basis. We're even seeing network sniffers being installed in IoT devices to help exfiltrate that data back to the attacker. And again, the purpose of this is so they can generate a long-term stream rather than hope you're going to pay a Bitcoin ransom. So as I said, I started out my career as an engineer. Um, it was nice back in the day when as a communications engineer, everything was serial, everything was isolated, and all I had to worry about was did it work on my truck. As we started to move forward, they said, you know, we need Ethernet on this because it takes too long to download the files. And as soon as we had Ethernet on it, the manager said, hey, we can bring that data back here and we can sell it again. So we started to have to consider con uh, security concerns. And as we got more and more into that field, we realized the depth of security and the lack of it that comes into embedded devices. So a few years ago, I moved over to an entirely security role. And one of my first things was going back to that engineering group and one, helping them to assess their security on board, but also help them understand what were the root causes of those security issues. What was creating that conflict between their engineering requirements and our security basics? So boiling that down, for engineers was a little tough. Um, they're not trained in the security portion and they're not usually willing to understand what that viewpoint looks like. So you break it down into, for IoT devices, our main point, how we reach out to the real world, is we use hardware access, right? You have to write to a serial port. You have to pull a sensor. And that comes down to a hex address and a hex data blob. On the IT side, we don't allow this kind of access, right? This is why even though we're a room full of security professionals, we probably don't have admin access to our own laptops. Same idea, you can't get that secure hardware so that you can't let someone else go and do something malicious with it. Automation is also core for IoT devices. We want to be able to script an entire process. We want to be able to go collect data, package the data, send it off, send postscripts to go with it, and continue to monitor the machine. So we have a wide range of applications that range from very secure, as in reading data and writing it into a database, to pulling crypto keys into a live environment and using those to connect back. On the IT side, we use UI escalation to mitigate this. We continually, every time we go to the bathroom, have to come back and log in. You want to install a new application? You have to log in again. It's been six weeks. Time to change your password. That's not a viable solution in IoT. These devices have to run unattended in the field for years. Also on the IT side, there is no security if you don't have physical security. And we know from the IoT side, we never have physical security. Our devices, the day they finish manufacturing, go out into the field, and we know that attackers are able to get their hands on them physically, tear them apart, do deconstructive processes, and get information off of them. So we have to pay particular attention to help hold our, our tightly controlled or critical data in an area where they can't get to, even if they do have physical access. Most importantly, the devices have to be self-sufficient. We've got databases, we've got user interfaces, we have configuration portions on board. And again, we use this in all the scriptable process, and they're all in the same box, they're all on the same partition, and they're running side by side. 
from the IT side, we look at this as a separation of duties. You're never going to put your database server right next to your crypto server. You're never going to put that next to your print server. And if you've got your wireless guest network tied into all of them, you're really in trouble. What this ends up being is there's a, a whole host of ideas that are diametrically opposed for how we can secure IoT. So if we get down to that root cause issue, why is it hard? Why do these two fight so much? Why is it not okay to run as root all, all the time? Why is it not okay to store your crypto certificate on board? And what it comes down to is the root of trust. At some point, you have to have an anchor in a hardware root of trust if you're going to properly segment your system. And that anchor is the ARM trust zone. It provides you that hardware certificate that can't be modified that you can use to validate each one of your higher layers as you move up. Segmenting that gives you isolation so your hardware is controlled, so your hardware isn't accessible from the normal world, and applications can't escape that control even if they're running as root. So if you have an adversary on your device and you're not able to get out or and they get root access to it, they're still not able to get into your uh, keys. So one of the, the fun stories I had with this was uh, back in the day we were talking about a device that was meant to write on the data link, and we had a, a, a kind of knockdown drag out with one of the engineers. And I told him that I can own your device, and as soon as I do, I can replicate any ECM on this machine, and I can write any message I want to. I can shut down portions and not others. I can stop the emergency brakes and not touch anything else. He said, my application doesn't do that. I'm like, that's cool. That sounds like that's hard. I'm not going to use your application. I'm just going to write to the hardware. What do you have in hardware that's going to stop me from writing a different ID address? Well, we don't have that. So when you do that segmentation, how is that actually done? When you start out in the old ring model security system, ring zero is where the kernel lived. That's what controls your hardware. That went up to device drivers to do your interface. For virtualization technologies, the hypervisor runs at a ring minus one. It becomes the gatekeeper for all of your hardware information, your hardware read writes. So this is really common in desktops. You're like, yeah, okay, we know this. This is Intel VTX. This is AMD V. What most people don't know is ARM has the ability to do this too. And they anchor it in that root of trust in the hardware base and allow you to do that proper segmentation where you can always have a gatekeeper, a trusted OS, being the ones that are allowing access to or from the hardware. And your normal operating system that still runs at ring zero can make calls, can run as root, and can still never get past that barrier. And basically, that is what TEE is. So there's a couple of good examples of TEE in the wild. Um, so if it's, why haven't we heard this? Well, how many people out here have a uh, Samsung flagship phone? A couple, all right. So Samsung Knox is one of the, the best full suite implementations of ARM Security Trust Zone. It starts out with the base hardware root of trust. They enable all the trust zone features in the chipset. They do the application splitting between the normal OS and the trusted OS. And then they have applications that run all the time to check and make sure that you're not messing with any of the, the application environment. They do continual validation. So this is why when we try and root our phones the day we're out of warranty, we trip that Knox flag and it can no longer be on a secure network. Again, Samsung has done it so well that they are the first commercial off-the-shelf cell phone manufacturer um, that's been allowed to actually process top secret data and it was cleared by DOD and NSA to do it. So it really does give you that level of security. Another good application are uh, Motorola or Aris cable set-top boxes. So we're talking a, a multi-billion dollar industry from entertainment. And how do they control what you get to see on your set-top box. Besides just plucking at your wallet, what they do is install an extra set of decryption keys in the trust zone for that processor, and that's what allows you to decrypt the content. It's also what makes it so that you can't easily export that video and copy it. So there's a lot of good applications in a lot of big uh, areas. So why isn't everybody doing it? Well, it's hard. Um, when we start out looking at the, uh, the processors, each processor requires a unique mapping between its hardware addressing and that virtual machine. So when Intel or AMD sell a processor for $100 to $1,000, they have the margin built in and the customer base asking for the, the security requirements, and they release that virtualization to you on the first day. 
And that's where it gets expensive. For us, when NXP sells us a $7 processor, they don't have the margin to build in those security features from the software side. It's in the silicone and it's out the door. So that means your team has to pick up the cost of developing a secure side and a normal side. And by the way, migrating products backward from a normal application and then splitting them out into a secure zone and a normal zone is really difficult. You have to reorganize how your I.O. works. You have to change how your processes work so that anytime you're talking to or touching secure data, you do it through the trust zone. So it ends up being almost a complete re-architecture. That's why it's usually recommended that you have two teams running side by side, or at least concurrently, one building the trust zone application and the API to get into it, and the next one building the, the normal world applications. And that's why it takes more time. Um, there's also not a lot of documentation that exists for trust zone. It's pretty hard to find. And traditionally, up until the last few years, finding example code in the wild has been very tough. So what does this all mean? It doesn't meet the low cost model that we have for ICS and IoT. Okay, so why have I wasted your time so much? I've got Secure Boot, I've done it right, I've got my operating system up and going and I know what's running. The problem with Secure Boot by itself is that its protection ends the moment you finish the boot process, right? So at that point, every bit of software that you have internal to your hardware is gonna run with the vulnerabilities that came with it. And if you're still using the basic applications that were probably shipped with that board support package, you're gonna have a lot of vulnerabilities. So when an attacker finally gains entrance to your device, it's not going to be because they brute forced the, the password for it. They're going to exploit something that's known and easy to do and easily replicatable. So you say, okay, well, I, I'm going to restart it and we'll go back. Okay, sounds good. If they put the time and effort into finding out how to exploit your system, they're going to have a record of what that exploit was, and they're going to continue to re-exploit it every time they see that they've lost contact with it. So Secure Boot is a phenomenal start. It's a great security process, and it is the core of the Trust Zone application. But after you get the booted process done, you have to still do your defense in depth and layering. Doing the trusted environment gives you a very powerful way to do that that ends up being easier and more straightforward than doing isolation and segmentation. So if you're excited and ready to go home and do this tomorrow, before you jump in, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Arm Secure Zone requires that hardware root of trust. So you first have to go and get Secure Boot working. After that, you turn on the Secure World bit in the processor, and besides getting a whole lot of new devices that light up instantly, now you've got the basis for trust to go out and do a secure OS, and a normal world OS, and build secure validated applications that can go and monitor the system while it's in use. Now to be honest, there are two different paths for TE. The one I've been talking about is the normal world and secure world OSs, but there also is a library mode where you can build just a secure library and you can use only that library to ferret data in and out of your secure or uh, critical areas. And, and this one is, is even harder to approach because the documentation is so poor. There's not developer guide references for it. There's not user guide references for it. The very few examples I've found out there from a code base were so simplistic in design, they were almost useless for an actual product. So that's why we're going to focus on the secure world and normal world. But it's still a lot of effort, right? So a few years ago, Opti was created. That's Open Source Portable TEE. It's an open source project that was started by and maintained by Linero and Wind River, where before they were just wind. Um, and they've done a lot of demo boards for all of the popular uh, chipset manufacturers. Um, so there's demo boards out there for NXP, for uh, Marvel, for TI, and you can go and download that and get them running on a board in a, about a few hours. They also actually have a package for Raspberry Pi, um, so you can go out and test stuff, but here's where we go back to some of the prior ideas. Um, the way the carrier uh, board is designed for Raspberry Pi, you're not allowed to bootstrap it properly or burn the fuses so that you can actually get that hardware root of trust. So while uh, you can develop your trusted environment, your normal environment, you can build your APIs, test your APIs. When it comes down to it, that attacker, again, can always go one level down and wipe out everything you've did. So pies are just for fun right now. A couple other things as we get into it. The first recommendation I have for everybody is don't overdo your secure world. 
everybody's first thought is, well, if it's secure, let's dump everything in there. Well, that's about the fastest way to open the keys of the kingdom and let everybody into your secure world and start to exploit your data. You know, from a, a cell phone perspective, we just downloaded a new game. We're excited to play. We open it up and says, please allow contacts. Please allow email contacts. Please allow your call record. Don't be that guy, right? Obviously, they're, they're trying to get your data out, but if you're not very careful in how you apply applications in the trust zone, you can inadvertently create those holes in the, in the applications. A couple other common hang-ups is first, don't mix any UI with hardware writing. UI isn't designed to make secure calls out. We're more focused on the user experience. It's generally larger, more complex. So have a ferret program that does your secure access for you, drops it in an area for your UI to go pick up and then read from there. The simpler we can keep those applications, the better. And again, minimize to the max. When we're talking about, say we want to do an SSL call, instead of putting the SSL library in the secure zone and running the entire thing for secure zone, run it in the normal zone. When you get to the point in the SSL process where you have to load your key, you make a call out to your API, you decrypt your key real time, and you feed it to the SSL application in a real time stream. That way it never resides in the normal operating system and it's completely protected by the uh, trusted application. And again, Simple apps only. We only want to do things that are absolutely necessary. So if we're doing a, a package to send stuff out and we're reading and writing data, we're packaging it up, we're shipping it off, we only want to use the secure zone to go down and grab just the encryption key or just the data encryption key. Or if we've got an a, a intellectual property process that's critical to us, we want to open only that process in the trusted zone and have it run something in the real world. And again, this is made easier by the API where you can actually reach in and trigger a secure process, but you can never reach in and trigger a hardware read-write directly. It has to, to touch an application that's been validated, and then that application will go forward for you. Probably the most important one is the smallest that's up on the slide, and that is don't self-test. As an engineer, I, I know from a lot of experience that when I design an application to work one way, I think it's going to work that way, and I can't get my brain around how I think it should work. So finding someone else to come in and think of what you didn't or figure ways to break your software that you didn't think were, were possible is absolutely critical if you're going to trust your company's IP, critical information um, in a trusted zone. So it's not foolproof, but it is a major leap forward. You still need defense in depth. You still need to isolate your web GUI, your UI, your configuration interface away from your primary applications. If you have the ability to go and take out root on all of the devices, you still need to do that. And the reason I say it's not foolproof is about two years ago, uh, NXP acknowledged a vulnerability in their chipset, where it was you were coming up into secure boot and you were loading the hash from the certificate. As it was processing that hash, if you overloaded that value, you would fail closed and continue to boot. So from an IT perspective, that's just disastrous. I mean, not only did you not check your input field, when you processed it and it failed, you continued to boot and you didn't or fail open. So the, the, the basic idea behind that is the smaller chipset manufacturers are just start, or the, the system on a chip manufacturers, pardon, are just starting to really get into the, the area where their, or their chips are used on a regular basis for security applications. They're new at it, they're learning. That vulnerability had been in the field for years before it was discovered. And it was first discovered by a group of pen testers who wanted to load their pen testing chip on an IMX in the pocket portion. Right? So as they were loading it up, they're like, hey, what happens if we just overload the certificate? And they were able to compromise the entire system. So let's say we're really a gung-ho. We're going to look at it. And how do we get the best return on our value? Where can we put our application of TEE on a product to make it most valuable for us? Well, first, again, we've got to stop, start with the SOC. You have to have that secure boot process. You have to get the trust zone operating on the chip. And as soon as you do that, you want to carve out a memory section. This memory can only be read in the trust zone. It's not at all uh, accessible from the normal world once you get it open. And here's where you can decrypt keys, where you can decrypt processes, um, where you can keep things that you need during runtime that are uh, critical or essential to your business. Next has got to be the I.O. At an absolute minimum, 
Your I.O. needs to be able to write only from the trusted environment. If you're able to do a full ferreting program where you can control your, your uh, reads and writes from there, it's better for you and you can again share it out to a memory location for fast access to whatever applications you're looking for. But saving that write function in the trusted environment is what gives us the security we need to guarantee that even if our device is compromised, even if all of our other security tests fail, that we can safely not allow a rogue program to write and change our physical world. For our communication stack, again, we want to leave most of the stack running in the, the normal world. You know, moving that entire thing in the secure world opens up just a number of different issues. But we can control that communications package by, again, pulling the crypto real-time live out of the trust zone. So it's not just for you know, certificates and for crypto on Ethernet. If you think about your data links, if you have a proprietary handshake and you only want that handshake available, or you want a real-time clock to generate something new for that, you can control just that security portion of your communication stack inside the TE environment, and then allow the rest of your stack to run as, as uh, normal so you don't have to re-engineer the world. I kind of mentioned it a little bit before, but as soon as you get the processor up and going into that secure world uh, area and that secure world bit is flipped, you start to get new hardware that pops up. Um, the first one is a secure clock. So that clock is run only in, in trust zone and can do stop, start, and resets. And if you get a timing attack on your board and somebody tries to roll back your onboard clock, you can compare that continuously against the secure clock and know whether or not you're having an issue. There's also a hardware secure watchdog. Um, that can only be stroked from the secure zone. So if you combine that watchdog with a, an application that's continually validating your software, making sure that no changes have been made to it, or you're continually validating which processes are running in your uh, process monitor, you have the ability to detect when somebody starts running something that's not appropriate, and the ability to even respond to it if you've got a clean copy in the back room. So next is JTAG. Um, we're, we're kind of skipping over that because it's a little bit of an old one. Um, but there, you know, the, the best idea is to take JTAG out of your product before it goes to the field. If that's not possible, at least with the secure world active, you can do secure JTAG. And that will encrypt the JTAG channel. And there's also a method to turn it off into a service mode only um, that, that's highly recommended once it gets into production. And finally, we have your hard drive space. Now, we know from a performance perspective, the hard drive, we cannot encrypt the whole thing. It just slows down embedded devices too much. But if you do want to do that small amount of storage where you keep your intellectual property buried, you can carve off a small partition, run it from the trust zone only, and have it only available to trust zone applications. That way you still run full speed for your normal applications, and you can you know, go far enough ahead to allow the decryption time for that small portion of the hard drive. So thank you guys for your time. Uh, long live integrity. Ready for any questions? All right, thank you, John. Uh, once again, I'm Jason Holcomb, also with Revolutionary Security. I'll be your moderator today. And uh, who has a question for John? I'm Alex with uh, HDS Global. Quick question, where does TPM fit into this? TPM? TPM? Okay, so TPM is, is a very similar hardware, but that's the, the, the desktop processor or server processor version, right? So Trust Zone and this uh, hardware security architecture is basically the exact same thing, but it's built for socks and microcontrollers instead of full-size processors. Same thing for the HSMs, very similar family. Very good. Okay, any other questions? Surely somebody has a question. Okay. So a number of the uh, processors, you, well, Chris Sundberg with Woodward, um, a number of the processors you saw up there, or some, in some of your examples, have FPGA mm -hmm. to uh, handle some of the I.O. Do you see Trust Zone and FPGA in some ways maybe collaborating for secure FPGA at some point in the future? You know, it would be fantastic because right now, you know, there are a lot of uh, ancillary devices connected through different bus lines. And again, right now, the only protection we have is to be able to control what writes to and from. Um, a lot of folks load digital patterns and data link patterns in those FPGAs. So being able to do that in the future would make a, a much more secure product where you're able to actually secure the, the you know, top to bottom transmission instead of just who's able to access the data link. All right, very good. Any other questions? I think we still have a few more minutes if anyone has a question. 
All right, if not, I'm going to ask you a very similar question to what I asked uh, the previous presenter. So from, a, from an asset owner perspective, what is it that you know, an asset owner should be thinking about or looking at to ask of their vendors uh, related to your topic here? That's a really good question, and I think uh, asset owners should be demanding that as part of their vendor engagement process. When you come in with your requirements for your product, having it be able to work in a secure mode and helping the vendor to understand um, what exactly it is that's driving that, what information you have on board, how it needs to be protected, uh, is the only way we're going to continue to push this to become more and more mainstream. Um, I think we're starting that process very well. I think we're probably about halfway there. Um, but as you see, the, the lower end socks, and especially the socks um, that are not as well, or the manufacturers aren't as well known, we're still getting a very slow uptake from that. Um, the biggest thing I, or the, the second thing I'd really encourage um, owners to do is when they do their development process, to have their guys go out and look at this information um, because we need to break down the idea that this is really hard and we can't do it anymore. Um, programs like Opti are really making a, a huge change in the amount of effort it takes to actually do a secure implementation and are bringing it down to the small company size where you don't have to have a Samsung or Motorola size budget um, to be able to get it done. All right, very good. Well, thanks again, John, and everyone please join me. Oh, actually, one, one more question. Uh, so let's, uh, let's have another comment or a comment about um, trust zone and virtualization. Okay. So a lot of these new chips, as I was on your slide, support virtualization. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on virtualizing some of those apps inside the trust zone and talking to the normal unsecured areas through virtualized containers, machines, et cetera? So the way it's done in, in the, the ARM processors is once you have that application up and validated, the communications that's done through it is all through API. And you have to have that secure bit enabled as part of that API. Um, so I, I think the question is, how do we, are, are, do we grow that expansion or do we keep it as a, a small line of communication? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think the way it's done right now, having that security bus that has to have that bit is the only way that you stop or slow down people from attacking that input side to the trust zone. Um, I, I'd love to see some of the stuff with containerization moved into this area and see how secure we can make that and see if we can grow that from a single API um, to more of a system-wide interface, a hardware interface that the containers use. Um, started to play with that a little bit a few years ago and haven't gotten real far on it. Um, the hardest thing that I've found with a lot of these systems is getting a very good virtual representation of a system on a chip. So being able to try those has been a little bit tougher and has ended up in a, a lot of the purple magic smoke coming out of some of the boards. 